strength and give us courage to confidently serve you. Amen. I want to just take a moment and talk to the children. We have a few children who are here today, but we also have some who are watching from at home. And uh, I want to tell you a little story, boys and girls. Uh, many, many years ago, I started writing a, a little story for the newspaper, and, uh, and I, got a, I got a note from someone who was reading that from Willimantic, Connecticut. And I don't remember exactly what that first story was that he wrote me about, but he was a dispatcher for the police and fire in Willimantic. And he said to me, he said, I love reading your column, and my mom is old, she's about 80, now I know that's not old for some of the grandmas and grandpas out there, but said, and she, she gets to hear it every week, I read it to her. And, and I thought that was so nice. And, and we would talk back and forth, and I got to meet his, his mom, and uh, we had a nice chat, and, and it was wonderful. And I didn't really hear from him. I moved down to Westerly here, and somewhere along the line, I wrote a story about being associated, being a volunteer fireman. And so all of a sudden, he wrote me another letter. And he said, you know, I've retired now. Mom has passed on, and she's gone to be with the Lord. But I wanted you to know that, uh, that I retired, and I went to become a volunteer firefighter too. And uh, I know that you went to the church in Lebanon, Connecticut. And so I kind of think that, that maybe you would like this. And he sent me along this patch. And it's a, a patch from the Lebanon, Connecticut Fire Department. And he said, I want to make you an honorary volunteer firefighter in your hometown. And so I, I, I looked at this and I really, I really loved it. And I said, thank you very much. I wrote him a nice note. But it got me thinking, you know, it's nice to have something like this that says, you know, you are a member, you are a volunteer, you are a friend of the community like that. Well, Jesus does the same thing. He, he called on all of us to be his partners in his work in the world. And some of your moms and dads and grandma and grandpas, they've been working in the church and they've been sharing God's love in many different ways. But I want to tell you, boys and girls, you're part of that too. You're one of the volunteers. And I don't have a patch to give you, but you know what? Jesus said, carry me around in your heart and let my love show. That'll be your patch. As you share my love with all the people you meet, people will know that you belong to me. And I thought that's a good lesson because we need to know that, that when we're out in the world, all of us, big and small, old and young, all of us who belong to Jesus need to be out there wearing our patch, and our patch is God's love. And so go ahead and share that. Share that with the world and let them know that you belong to Jesus. Well, thank you very much, boys and girls, and I hope you have a great week. Uh, it looks like we're going to have some good weather today and tomorrow and, and maybe into the week. So thank you for watching. I'm going to invite Jerry now to share with us our scripture reading from the book of Colossians. Today, we're going to be talking about the um, scripture reading, the book from Colossians. In your bulletin is a 3, 1 through 14, but we're only going to be reading 1 through 4 today. <clears throat> Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above, where Christ is sealed at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. May God add a blessing to his word. This morning, we're going to finish up our three-week series, Rooted in Christ, the Anxiety-Free Life. And again, I go back to Psalm 30 as we begin Psalm 30 says, I will exalt you, Lord. You lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord, my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. I think that the Apostle Paul could have echoed that, those words as he was writing to the Colossians here in chapter 3. If you want to get rid of anxiety, worry, or fear then you need to look up. 
listen to the words of Paul. He says, set your hearts on things above, not on earthly things. Why? Because he says, you have been raised with Christ. Now your life is in his hands. In other words, you're rooted in him. And that's a cause for celebration. That now you are no longer alone drifting, but that you are firmly in his hands. If you've ever been to Disney World, you know that they celebrate every day at least twice. And and I know one of the fun parts is no matter where you are in the park, at a certain time of the day, something happens, and next thing you know, people are lining up, everybody ready to watch the parade. And they come through joyfully with music and with all kinds of colorful figures, and, and it is something to be seen. And then later on at night, there's some kind of a fireworks or light spectacular at every one of the parks. And people come back if they've, if they've gone back to their hotels or whatnot, just to witness the party and the celebration and the parade of lights. No wonder it's been called the happiest place on earth. Well, there's no happier place than being in the arms of Jesus That's why the Apostle Paul could say in Philippians 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. It's almost unthinkable that you could become overdone with stress and anxiety at the same time that you are celebrating and praising God. That's the point. That's what being rooted in Christ means. That you are in His presence, that you are walking with Him, that you are living with Him, that every moment of your life is in Him. And that, and that means that anxiety can dissipate because you are living in Him. You can rejoice and celebrate because you have so much to be thankful for. Paul reiterates this again in his letter to the Ephesians when he says, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Always giving thanks. Now how can he say that? The answer is found in our reading today. As we conclude this series on the anxiety-free life, Paul tells the Colossians that the secret is to keep looking up, to keep your eyes, your focus on Jesus. The problem for many of us is that we take our eyes off of Christ. We look at our circumstances, we look at our problems, and get bogged down and begin to sink. Anxiety and fear set in. Worry overcomes us. You know, that's what happened to Simon Peter. You remember the story in the Bible where he and the disciples are out on the lake late at night. Jesus had gone off to pray, and all of a sudden they see Jesus coming across the water, walking on the water. They think it's a ghost. But Peter, as usual, steps up and says, Lord, is that you? If that's you, then bid me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. Peter does an amazing thing. I I imagine the other disciples are looking on almost with horror as, as Peter takes one leg and steps out onto the water and then the other leg and he begins to walk on the water. He begins to do the impossible. He's moving above the waves and the sea and everything, just heading towards Jesus. But then it says this, it says, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. You know, I think many of us have experienced that, that, that we may be walking high in our faith and nothing can touch us. And all of a sudden, we take our eyes off of Christ and we begin to think and look at the problems in our lives. And that's when we say, woe is me. And we begin to sink. Paul is very clear in this passage that we're looking at today. If you continue on past what we read, he says that we need to begin living our new life and put away Or in other words, stop falling into the things of the past. And many of those things of our past that he points to are things that actually tend to weigh us down. And he doesn't pull any punches. He says, don't give in to sexual immorality and to greed and idolatry. Put off your anger, slander, and filthy language. Now, you know, most of us have a couple of things. I used to say that I'm pretty good on the Ten Commandments. I've never murdered anyone. (laughs) And we kind of just slip past the lying and the cheating and all those other things in there. Well, most of us, when we look at the things that that are a part of our lives, we know that it is many of these things that the Scripture point to 
that often bring us down, that lead to anxiety and worry, the fear of getting caught or, or found out, the regrets that we have. You see, these are the things that bring on the anxiety, the frustration and worry, and we get so caught up in the day-to-day minutia that we forget to look up to God. We wonder, we wonder, will He save us? Did we handle things right? We live with we coulda, shoulda, woulda. And we let these things drag us down and forget the promise and the future that Jesus offers us. That's why I'm so glad that we come to the Lord's table so often. It reminds us that we have been forgiven. We have a clean slate. We can start over and live to the glory of God. The bread and the cup remind us that Jesus died for us. He took the punishment for our sins so that we could live free of the greatest source of anxiety and worry, the fear of death and judgment. Paul says now you can set your hearts on the things of God. You can be an instrument of His glory, and we can truly live. Rejoice in the Lord always. Do you know people like that? That are always smiling, always happy, always looking for the silver lining? Why? Because they know that something good is going to happen. This is what what Jesus encouraged us to do, is to, to look to Him, to look up, to believe that He will take care of things. Now that doesn't mean that we don't need to act and to do what's right. But it's trusting in the Lord. You know, when I was out in Seattle last week, my daughter took me up on the top of one of these these hills. And I think it's a hill compared to the mountains, but it was up, it was up about four miles. And as we were up there, we could see all the mountains around, and we sat down to have our lunch, and as we sat there on this little wooden fence in front of us, came a little bird. And the bird just sat there, looking at us. And so I said to Sarah, I said, do you think I can give it, you know, Sarah's a veterinarian, so she's the expert. Uh, I said, do you think I could give it a little piece of bread? And Sarah said, "I, I don't see what it would hurt. And so we gave the bird a piece of bread, and then the bird wanted another piece kept coming back. It would fly off, maybe to feed some babies or something like that, but it would fly back. And then Sarah said to me, she said, you know, it's amazing. The birds are always able to find what they need, whether we're there or not. And it just brought to mind that passage in the scriptures when, when, when Jesus was talking about worry and fear and anxiety, and, and he said to them, look at the birds. Look at the birds. They, they, they don't have to worry about it. Your heavenly Father takes care of them. One day in a walk, I saw a bird had a worm. Now, I wouldn't want a worm, but that bird wanted that worm. I thought about the fact that God does take care of them. Jesus says, look at the, the, the flowers of the field. They neither toil nor spin. They don't make their own clothing, but look at how beautiful they are. And this time of the year, all the flowers, all the trees are in bloom, and you look around. And Jesus was trying to say that if you put your trust in me, You can be like them. You don't have to worry. You just go out. You live to the glory of God. And I will take care of these things. And I think some people get it. That's why they can go around looking for the silver lining. Because they believe that God is with them. And this is what Paul was getting at. He reminds his readers that they've already received the promise and the blessing. And he calls on them to remember in those moments of anxiety or doubt or worry or fear to look up. Because when you look up, you begin to remember that there is someone in heaven who loves you. Every time I go to a place where there are mountains, and we saw Mount Rainier, and we saw the other mountain ranges, the Olympic mountain ranges, and they were so beautiful. And it reminded me of when I went to Colorado and the great national forest there, the Smoky Mountains, and going up and seeing the mountains and the snow in the middle of July and just marveling and saying, this is what David was talking about. Where does my help come from? I look up and it's up there. I see the mountains. Another place, he says, I see the moon and the stars. This is the God who has called us to be part of of his community, of his family. Today I want to focus our attention on thanksgiving. I'm not talking about the holiday, I'm talking about the practice of thanksgiving. Charles Dickens, you remember him? He's the one who wrote A Christmas Carol, Oliver Twist, A Tale of Two Cities. He said that we're kind of mixed up in America. 
He suggested that instead of having one Thanksgiving day each year, we should have 364. Use one day for complaining and griping. And use the 364 other days to thank God each day for the blessings that he showered upon us. Dickens may be on to something. If you want to live an anxiety-free life, then you need to join a Thanksgiving parade. It's been written, it's not life circumstances that determine the quality of our lives, but how we respond to them. That's why a Thanksgiving parade would be great. It would be a reminder of the gratitude that we need, the sense of wonder and appreciation we must have if life is to be fully embraced and live. Thanksgiving was never meant to be a one-day thing. It should be a season of perspective that goes on and on. Just as we heard Mrs. Scarano give thanks to God today for the miracle in her life, all of us have those miracles in our life, those, those moments, those circumstances where we can just pause and give thanks to God. And sometimes we let them go and we forget about them. They're in the past, but we need to continually remember and give thanks. For when we say thank you, we are saying that we're dependent on others. We're dependent on God and we're appreciative of what he's done for us. It causes us to pause and to take stock of our blessings so we can realize how much we have and where it comes from. That's what we do at the table. When we come to the Lord's table, we, we pause and, and maybe once a month or, or maybe once a week or once a day, depending on the different faith traditions, we pause and we stop and say, look at what you've done for me, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. You know, one preacher wrote this. He says, even though we growl and hate to get up when the alarm rings each morning, thank you, Lord, that we can hear and have the strength to rise. There are those who are deaf and bed-bound. Even though the first hour of the day is often hectic, that's the time when you can't find your socks and the toast is burnt and tempers are short, thank you, Lord, for our family. There are those who are living alone and lonely. And even though our breakfast table never looks like the pictures in the ladies' magazines and the menu at times is unbalanced, thank you, Lord, for the food that we have. There are many who wake up hungry. Even though the routine of my job is monotonous, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to work. There are many who have no work. Even though we grumble and bemoan our fate from day to day and wish our modest circumstances were not quite so modest, thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. You know, once we've counted our blessings, given thanks for them, it helps keep us humble. It puts everything into perspective and leaves us contented with what we have, even If it isn't a lot, we can say thank you for those things. To thank God for all that we have is to remember the rich and rare blessings that we enjoy, the things that money cannot buy. You know, the story is told of of Alexander White, a Scottish preacher, and he always began his prayers with some expression of gratitude. Well, on this one particular Sunday morning, it was raining, sheets of rain. It was blustery out. And and as they got to the church, the heat was out. So it was cold and damp. And not only that, but they developed a leak in the corner of the sanctuary. And and it was a place where, where a lot of people sat. It must have been in the back. Uh, and and so, so as, as, as they got to the church, one member said to another, I want to see what he's thankful for today because this is one of the worst Sundays we've ever had. Well, when Pastor White began his prayer, he said this, We thank thee, Lord, that it's not always like this. A simple prayer. But the point is that we should look for things to be thankful for because there are plenty of them all around us. And that brings us back to Paul's word this morning. He says, since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on the things above. When we give thanks for what we have, we're forced to think about God, the great giver of all gifts. Scripture lays out for us what God has done and reminds us to be thankful for it. So does this table that we are going to sit at in a moment. When we thank God for all he's done and given to us, we focus our attention on his grace and on his power. That alone can reassure us that everything else is going to be okay. Did you know that the word thank and the word think 
are from the same root? That's no accident. The two words have so much in common because true thankfulness grows out of thoughtfulness. So let me invite you today to take the next couple of minutes to start a thanksgiving parade that can extend into your week. Pause now and think about Jesus and and what he means to you. Then think about the other things in your life that you have to be thankful for. You might be like Alexander White and simply give thanks that it isn't raining today, that we've got a beautiful day to enjoy. Or you can begin to count your blessings and name them one by one as the old song says. Let's just take a moment now and think and reflect on the things that you have to be thankful for.